Verbally Effective with Ina Esco is an interview-style podcast that intersects art, culture, politics, and entertainment with a Memphis focus. Each week, I'm joined by a featured guest with roots in Memphis. Verbally Effective delves into each guest's personal journey to uncover the incredible stories fueling their purpose, the highs and lows of their pursuits, and how through their passion, they are moving the culture forward. Be sure to follow Verbally Effective and Ina Esco on Instagram. Also, download the Verbally Effective podcast on SoundCloud, iTunes, and Google Play Music. Don't forget to check out the website and submit to be a guest at Verbally Effective. Hey guys, welcome to another edition of the Verbally Effective Podcast. I am your host, your double E, Ina Esco. Hey, I need you all to subscribe to the podcast right now on all streaming platforms. We are on there, Verbally Effective. Also, download that YouTube channel and hit the subscribe button as well for the Ina Esco YouTube channel. And you know, this pod intersects art, culture, politics, entertainment with a Memphis focus all powered by we are memphis check it out y'all i have a big treat for you ladies and gentlemen i know we are on the heels of one of our favorite shows on stars right now yep i'm talking about p valley yep y'all talking about it it's in your mouth and i have one of the stars here with me tonight he is also an entrepreneur amongst plenty other titles we're gonna get right into it talking about Bertram Williams Jr. Oh, what's up, Dina? <laughs> Thank you so what's much. What's up? For How you me. doing? I'm doing good. I feel super grateful to be sitting here with an actual living legend. Like I've been listening to your voice, uh respecting your work for How long now? Maybe like uh like 24, 24 years. years. Yes. You started when you were Five years old. Ah oh, man, thing. can you believe it? Yeah, and I'm super happy to be here with you. I appreciate that, mm -hmm. Bertram. I really do. Um, and you know what? I'm proud of you. Now we're gonna get into the discussion, but I am so proud of you and the work that you've been doing and your wife Taliba. Like y'all are like black love, like yeah, and a power couple. I, yeah, I almost said I, I F with her. That's, yes. my, that's my girl. Yeah. I know you do. Uh -huh. I know you do. But you know what? We're gonna start at the beginning. What part okay. of Memphis are you from? Bertram. Yeah, so I got roots in South Memphis. My father is from uh, the Florida, Kansas area. Okay. Where my great grandmother raised, he and his four brothers. Shout out to the 630 boys off Florida Street. She made them folks be in the house by 630. You okay. know what I mean? Gotcha. Yeah, gotcha. and that, uh, those are my guys. And so I spent a lot of time in that area. Uh, but I also spent time in Whitehaven, mm -hmm. Hickory Hill. I guess like a lot of Memphians, we kind of bounce around, you know. Mm -hmm. um, to right now I live in South Memphis okay. uh, over near the Castalia area. And so you could say I'm citywide. You citywide. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I know you went to Overton High School. Yeah, that's so right. So what were you into at Overton? Because I know that's a school of performing arts, right? Right, right. Okay. So as you would guess, I was in the theater program there. That's where I went. That's where I met my little giant Taliba uh, in the <laughs> theater legit. department over okay. at Overton. Um and so, yeah, that school is a performing arts school and one where I really kind of got to embrace being weird. You know, I think growing up in Memphis, we get kind of trained up in this idea of like, and it's a protection thing too, but like we got to play it cool. You know what I mean? We can't really uh, practice vulnerability, but over the kind of created the space for me to do that. One of my guys, uh, Tony Smith, who does some uh, promoting around town, was joking with me uh, a week ago and about this time when we were uh, entering into the International Thespian Society at Overton, right? Tony too? Tony? Well, no, he wasn't in it. He was okay. a student there. Okay, he was gotcha, a student, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. but he was recounting a time when me and the rest of the theater guys okay. were uh, pledging, essentially, and we had the nerd day. We had the mime day where we couldn't talk, and he was like, bro, I used to think to myself, what the is BJ <laughs> doing? You know what I mean? But I look back on that experience, and like I said, it kind of gave me the the freedom, the courage to be a little different, to step outside of the norm. And so, you know, I appreciate Overton for that. How did you sure. get involved in the theater, like your very first time getting into theater? What made you do it? Yeah, so I um, I grew up in a Baptist church, Pilgrim Rest Baptist Church. And I think my legit first performance was a church play. Mm -hmm. I was about 
10, 11, 12, somewhere up in there, and they cast me as Jesus. You know what you I mean? You was Jesus. I was Jesus. Uh, my girl, Danica, <laughs> she had me in there. She uh, They did put the makeup on me, so I had the, you know what I'm saying, the scars where the thorns were, and I, I said some lines in Latin. You feel okay. what I'm saying? Yeah, I was I said, Eli, Eli, lama sabatina. I'll never forget that. That was my first oh, wow. claim to fame because I did that thing. Um, and so, yeah, I guess that really kind of piqued my interest. And from there, uh, I had done some arts camps. I was really fortunate to do some stuff like uh, Echoes of Truth. Uh, wow. where a lot of local artists kind of got their star. And then I'm on my way to Overton. And um, in a few plays there, I got my chance to really kind of step into, like, my leading man mm-hmm. energy. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I guess, like they say, the rest is history. The rest is history. Now, were your parents big proponents of you in the theater? Absolutely. Super supportive. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's funny because my father is very charismatic. Uh, my mother is a little more demure, but neither of them really got into the arts as young people. Mm-hmm. That's not true. My mama was in the band. She played clarinet. And my dad, he just, he's from South Memphis, he was good at shooting the does, and so he was a comedian. Okay, you know I mean? got you. Uh, but yeah, they were super supportive of me, um, obviously taking me to rehearsals and um, signing me up for, you know, any opportunity uh, that would uh, give me a chance to kind of stretch out as a creative and a performer. And so, um, you know, I, I think my mom may have literally every playbill that I uh, have been in from mm-hmm. middle school all the way up to the stuff I've done at Hattie Lou Theater and beyond because they are, they're wow. proud of their boys. You know what, um, in middle school and high school, I was in theater arts too, but I, I can understand what you're saying. I'm, I haven't done anything with acting like as an adult, what but I want right to. Oh, I kind of want to a little bit. Yeah. Because once you get that bug, it's always there, mm-hmm. the performance of it all, right? Yeah, yeah. Right, getting into character. But That's right. we're sticking on you right now, Bertram. So, oh, no. look. Well, where'd you, you go to school, though? I, I graduated from Millington High School. Okay, okay. But I only went there one year. I got you. And the year before that, I was at Raleigh, Egypt, and I had I, I wasn't living in Tennessee before that. Okay. So I dealt with a lot of transition. Okay. So okay. that's why we're going to stick on you right okay. now, Bertrand. all right, all right, my bad. I'm <laughs> so sorry. let's talk about when you graduated from Overton. Mm-hmm. What happened next for you? What happened next? I went off to the U of M. Why um, U of M? It's so funny because I, I think a lot of, you know, I work with students now, and there's this kind of like despondence that I think some folks have about college. I didn't really care about going. I really just went because I felt like it was the natural thing to do. It was what my parents wanted me to do. And so, to be frank, U of M was kind of a default. It's like I, mm. you know, I got in, and that's no disrespect to the U of M. It's mm-hmm. a brilliant institution. I understand. And has produced a lot of great folks that I got a lot of respect for. But at that phase of my life, I could care less about having gone to college so, and you know that manifested in me getting put out of U of M what? have you ever met somebody that got suspended from college no you did I got put on academic suspension like my second semester at the U of M because I was straight BS and I had some friends who still lived in town I was trying to I was kicking <laughs> it in South Memphis I was, didn't want to live in the dorms because mm-hmm. I wanted to smoke a look well, you know what I mean? Yeah, I got you. I got and you. so, uh, yeah, I really wasn't committed or focused because I I kind of saw a different life for myself. I wanted to be in creative spaces. I was looking to uh, show up in entrepreneurial spaces. And at that time, I had yet to connect the importance or the opportunity that is present in the college setting. You know what I mean? The relationships you make and obviously the things you stand to learn. Yeah. But I did end up graduating anyway. You at did. a point, I finally kind of got uh, some sense knocked into me. Um, so, what was the awakening? So I, uh, while I was on suspension, I was uh, broke and uh, trying to make money. I was working as a carpenter and painter with my uncle, Carlton, right. my father's brother, one of the 630 boys. <laughs> and so um, one day I was up on a two-story high ladder, and it was about 110 degrees out mm. We were painting a house that had 63 windows. 63. And so we had been humping. I dropped my hammer and, you know, I scaled down the ladder after I might have finished the windowsill. By the time I went to pick up the hammer, I touched the head of it and it was too hot for me to pick mm. up with my bare hands. And I said, I need to take my 
self on back to school because it, it was at that point where I realized I wanted to really exercise my mind, my creative prowess. And if I didn't learn how to channel that, I would be like, you know, committed to doing manual labor. And that's again, no, no shade to that. I love working with my hands, mm-hmm. but I realized that I would be leaving something on the table if I didn't, you know, work to kind of strengthen my faculties and yes. learn how to use that in a way that'll be productive. Now, what was your major at Memphis? I got my undergraduate degree in business economics. Okay. I started out, you know, before I got suspended, uh, pursuing a degree in marketing management. But when I went back, funny enough, I, um, during that same season where I was kind of having this, these series of come to Jesus meetings, I was reading a lot. And so I started reading some uh, literature, you know, Dr. King's speeches, mm-hmm. Malcolm X's biography, and some of the through lines that really stood out for me were really centered around economic justice mm-hmm. um, and things, um, well, yeah, that really more pointedly. And so, you know, I thought to myself, I'm going to go back and study economics so I can figure out how to show up for my people. Okay. And so that's what inspired me to go and get that undergrad in uh, business economics. And I went on to graduate and started a um, a master's program in the city and regional planning department okay. with the same end in mind, ultimately looking to show or find out or learn how to serve the people. Mm-hmm. Uh, I ain't finished that joint though. You, you know didn't finish that got, one. I bet I you learned a, a lot though. Thing. Definitely learned a lot, met a lot of great people and a lot of what we took in in those classes. And I'm maybe just a semester shy of finishing the degree, but uh, a lot of what I took in, I've been able to apply and it informs how I'm showing up right now. So, Yes, Still. yes, and you're all about the community. Right. Um, but before we get off the of University of Memphis, uh, like I told you when you got here, I didn't know you was a member of Omega Sci-Fi Fraternity uh, Incorporated. <laughs> when yeah. did you pledge? So I pledged. It was my senior year, fall 2013. And how did that happen? Man, I grew up with a deep admiration for the Qs. A lot of my coaches growing up at Colonial, shout out to Coach Gary Greer and Daryl Mitchell and all of them, they were the bros. And so I um, I had a, a a real respect for those guys and really just the impact they had on folks like me and my teammates. And so I made a decision young that if I pledged anything, it was going to be the cues. Okay. And so, uh, yeah, I got there and I almost made it out without pledging, but, you know, I was, feel fortunate to have uh, made some real friends going through yeah. that process. Uh Still keep up with my LBs. Good. How many like were on your line? Six of us. I'm the, the five. Oh, that's a good little number. Uh-huh. You number five. Yeah, I'm the five. Okay. It, um, man, that experience, which I won't go into too much detail. Yes, yes. But it was uh, <laughs> truly formative, you know. Mm-hmm. And to be able to go through something like that in my, I was in my early, like my mid-20s actually, because mm-hmm. it took me a little while to graduate. We talked about that. Gotcha. Gotcha. But, uh, I, I'm super thankful, you know, proud to be the bros for sure. Okay, gotcha. Now, yeah. um, you know, you mentioned you did graduate from the University of Memphis, and I know that acting bug was still up in you. Mm-hmm. I mean, because I would have thought you would have said, hey, I was a theater major, mm-hmm. didn't go that route. Mm-hmm. So tell me about how you continued this thespian journey of yours. Yeah, so it really worked out in that uh, my senior year in high school, I met Ekundayo Bendele, who was the founder of Hattie Luthi. And so we were able to start building a relationship fresh out of high school. And so when I was pursuing the degree and dropping out and all of that, I was still working over at Hattie Lou. And some of it had me distracted, if I'm being honest, because (laughs) I was having more fun down there. I was running lights. That's why you was on academic probation. Right, right. I'm uh, doing five shows a weekend in some instances. And so, um, yeah, I really was able to, you know, exercise or show up as a thespian in that space. And I'm so thankful for that you know, relationship and that opportunity because it really did make it so that I could, could like, keep the dream alive, you know. Um, and, again, I met so many good people, uh, learned so much, and just got comfortable on stage. And, mm-hmm. you know, were it not for the Lou, like, I, I wouldn't be where I am today, that's for sure. For sure, for sure. Now, you know, I remember, like, scrolling through Instagram a few years back, coming across your page, and you were out – in the elements, farming and and growing, uh, you know, like yeah. food and yeah. talking about sustainability, and I was like, wow, yes, yes, Bertram. Yeah. <laughs> and so, 
you know, I, I'll never forget that. And then I started zooming in to, um, you know, your whole profile. And I was like, I like what he's talking about. Tell me your relationship with sustainability. Yeah, so it's funny. It's actually a continuation of what I spoke to with regard to my collegiate experience, right? I um, have this real just curiosity and conviction around making sure the people straight. Yes. And that thought process has evolved to like really thinking about the planet because mm -hmm. if the planet ain't straight, we ain't straight. If our food ain't straight, we ain't straight. And so like this same passion has basically evolved to like a deep curiosity around food production, mm -hmm. um, around promoting urban gardening. Um, it's so funny this, I guess, yeah, this summer, I, uh, started a little garden in my front yard and I'm sure it's probably illegal and it be looking crazy <laughs> sometimes, but I did it so that people would kind of get audacious in thinking about how we have power enough to grow our own food. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And so um, that hood homestead, as we like to call it, uh, has done some cool stuff and it's been a conversation starter amongst our little community. My neighbors from across the street come over, uh, Miss Madeline and Willie, they come and get some kale from me if it's popping. Uh, I got a group of young people who live up the street from me that uh, like to come down and you know work and learn a little bit. And so, um, yeah, that, that space, that gardening and farming space and conversation is one that is really top of mind for me right now. Mm -hmm. And that may sound kind of counterintuitive because, you know, there are opportunities in TV and film, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, I, I care most deeply about the folks around me and us being able to be self-sufficient. So, yeah, I think a lot about growing stuff. Yes, definitely, definitely. Now, um, you know, you mentioned film and TV. So yeah. let's go on, hop into that conversation. Let's do it. Um, we just saw the second uh, season of P-Valley. The finale just happened. And let me tell you, Bertram, <laughs> <laughs> like compared to season one to season two, mm. Um, I will say I saw the growth in your character as Wody. Yeah. Like, you know, you out here killing folks man, on TV man. too, man. Merc that like, man. You murk that man with the <laughs> fentanyl, man. Like, what? Right, right, right. <laughs> so, um, and I remember, um, you know, even before I saw the finale and saw you, you know, in this role in Wody, I remember seeing you at another event and you were talking about, you know, how – it was a game changer when you got management, I believe, mm. with um, this acting world. Mm -hmm. So talk to us about that. Yeah, yeah. So um, it, it's, it's really kind of serendipitous in that I, I was able to land the role of Wody uh, without representation, uh, built an organic relationship with Katori herself. Um, and so I, I did season one, you know, as a – Brother fresh off the street, right. pretty much. You know what I mean? I've been plucked from community theater, but I was uh, really blessed to um, get connected with uh, my now manager. Her name is LZ, uh, based out of L.A. now, who uh, actually just had a mutual uh, friend and uh, acquaintance, this powerful sister named Jasmine Manns, who uh, is a poet and writer. Um, and so they had the relationship uh, LZ tells a story that she uh, was just binging the series season one, P Valley, and saw me and uh, reached out just based on that little bit of time I was on the screen through Jasmine. And so um, linking up with her has really just changed the game for me in that, it, for one, it's super affirming, right, to have somebody working at the level that she's working at to see something in me and want to invest her time and make the calls and, you know, speak on my behalf and support. Um, and, and two, it's been beneficial in that she be getting me paid. Like them chicks okay. look different. Season two way different than season one. Cause L, you know, L, good. so I'm too nice, right? Like I, I will, you know, I, I am self sacrificial sometimes. Right. But is he going to come and say, uh, uh, we need this, that, and the third. And yeah. that has really, Show me what's possible on that end too, like yeah. opening up to like getting paid, opening up to like knowing my worth, knowing our worth, and so mm -hmm. yeah, it has been a game changer in that regard. Yes. Now, mm -hmm. how has your you know experience been working on P Valley? Tell me, tell uh, me. When I tell you, first off, those folks, the cast, a lot of the production folks that we are blessed to work with, writers, directors 
producers are such good people. Like I have no real experience to compare it to, but hearing them talk about other production they they other productions they've been on, mm-hmm. it's a different vibe because uh, I think it you know they say it starts at the top, and Katori has approached this body of work. Uh, the way she's hand selected people from the top down with such intention that is like manifesting how we show up for each other, how the end product uh, is is developed, and so um, that that piece, that relational piece of it is paramount for me. Like I've made forever friends in the cast and some folks that I've uh, met on the show. Now, as a performer, you can only imagine, right? Like I. I was in the community theater. We, you know, <laughs> we got 100 people, 150 yes. people in the audience. And now I'm on set with 150 people right. watching, seeing what's going on. And there's a lot of pressure that comes with that. Um, and I joke with some of my guys because I'm also like, I can be critical of myself as an artist. I think we all kind of got that. And so I'm watching season one with some of my guys. I'm like, ah, ooh, ah, ooh. <laughs> I need another shot. And so uh, season two, while I still, have some of those moments there way fewer and uh, farther in between, and I think you know that speaks to a level of um, of like not not just growth, but like um, just deeper understanding of myself and how I stand to show up in stories like that. Mm-hmm. And so um, that's super cool. Um, and let me see what else. Am I? Do you feel like I, I, I got, got you? I got you. Now yeah. I want to know like when you read the script. Um, for the scene where you had to kill, oh boy. Mm-hmm. What were you thinking when you first read it? Like, oh, they got me doing that. Yeah, I was like, it's That's kind of different for you, it's but not for really. Me. Yeah, uh, right. Because you yeah, were already I'm accustomed in the, to death. And, yeah. Yeah, in between worlds, uh, working in the funeral home. My right. kid, Devoti, uh works in and manages a funeral home. And so I, um, yeah, I, I was excited to have some action, you know, as a just a watcher of the story. I was able to kind of remove myself and think about what I would want to happen to that brother that, you know, that I had to get up out of here. And it felt like a a huge opportunity, obviously, to kind of try to communicate such a a critical moment in that story. Um, And so, um, man, I... I, I poured over that thing, just trying to show up for the moment. My boy Ralph, my good brother, he he was with me in Atlanta. He was working, you know, working with me. Try, no, you need to do it like this, bro. No, nah, not for real. Try, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and and, and it, it is something that I can't say that I'm proud of. And I've been yes. super uh, thankful to see the response that it's gotten. Like, I, I've been getting a whole lot of love. And, yes. and you yes. know. Yeah, I'm just looking for some more opportunities to. Some more opportunities. What's, what's up with season three? Uh, we gonna see. I, okay. Um, you know, I feel like, you know, I'm a newbie in this industry, mm-hmm. and uh, but one thing that I do know is that things can be fickle, right? And so I actually made a post the other day telling people to go and like and review the show uh, on some of these platforms like IMDb and Rotten Tomatoes because it's like. This thing can be a cult classic in our culture. But what we know to be true is that a lot of times the folks in show business could care less really about what we need or want as a people or a culture. And it, yes. it all boils down to like the brass tax. And so, mm. um, and so, you know, we've been really trying to do our part to not only present a story that folks will love, but also like telling people how this side of the business works so that we can ensure that we can continue to grow. And so we all... You know, I'm holding out hope that we'll go it's three, like four, five, right six, now. seven, eight, you know, yeah. uh, seasons. Uh, so, yeah, y'all go and, and like and review the show if you Dude, if you miss with like it. Like and review. Now, before we get off of P-Valley, we got to hit on something because <laughs> this is something that, um, you know, I'm sure you've heard this several times because of the content um, in P-Valley that represents the LGBTQ community. Mm. You know, mm-hmm. you got Uncle Clifford, mm-hmm. La Murder. Yeah, they yeah. booed up. Right, right. And, and it just seems like so many people had an issue with it. Mm-hmm. Like, but for me personally, I didn't. Because I'm like, y'all always looking at women do this. Right. On a normal TV show. But for right. me, it was more so, I feel like I never saw the intimacy side between men. Mm-hmm. Like, that's how it was different for me. But... You know, you go on social media, honey, they couldn't up. Right, right. And you know what? It's like, um, I can't remember the act, 
actress his name, but there was a time when no black people were on television, right? Yes. And when the first person made that appearance, the whole world was up in arms, mm-hmm. right? And so I say it like this, the folks who that upset about Lil Murder mm-hmm. and 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 uh, Uncle Clifford, I, I put them in the boat with them people. They were mad to see black folks on the TV. You know okay. what I mean? Because these brothers represent, um, you know, a population of people that not only deserve love because they're human, but they are good people. If you wear, if you fresh, like you wearing some nine times out of ten made by somebody from the LGBTQ plus IA community. That's true. You feel what I'm saying? That's true. And I feel like people really gotta uh, confront whatever it is they dealing with that would yeah. make them so uncomfortable uh, with that type of relationship, like you said, that is being uh, displayed with such nuance, mm-hmm. with such honor. Uh, folks gotta, you know, take whatever time they need to deal with that. And I'm, I'm happy that this show. It's starting these types of conversations because we need to have them because the same people that's upset if it's not them they got relatives that are in same sex or have been in same sex relationships so stop being weird bro stop being weird show love bro it's not <laughs> hard you feel what i'm saying yes and and you know i was telling you know now some people have their um preferences as it relates to like just sex in general on television right and so that um, that type of critique is one that, you know, I, I feel deserves some credence, but it's also like, just turn it off then if you don't want to see nobody has sex. Basically. You know what I'm saying? Yes, yes. Well, you know, um, I hope y'all get a season three and I hope you Me get some too. more roles. Yeah, and I need that. Yes, they mm-hmm. coming. Now, I do want to ask you this. You know, there are some people who say that you can't have major success and stay in Memphis, but mm. you've proven that wrong. Why do, why do you think you've been able to be successful and still thrive in Memphis? Dang, I appreciate you saying that. Um, I guess because I lead with love. I've been doing the best I can to, like, you know, leave people feeling a little better once I'm gone than they were before I came. And also... Like, because I really believe in Memphis. Mm -hmm. You feel me? Like, Mm -hmm. you know, I think even in the last 10 years, and I'm super thankful for it, but I've watched this kind of shifting narrative where it's like way more hoorah around the city, which again, like I'm thankful for, but 10 years ago and even before, like it was like shouting into a, a, a void if you were looking to praise Memphis, because as you know, for so long, folks been hating on the city and only want to talk about the negative. And so um, I kind of made it my mission, uh, you know, some years ago. It's so funny. I'm tripping because uh, uh, I did this in a very literal sense, right? I would, I don't know who's going to watch this. I'd take my shirt off and show you. I got a big ass, me- oh, I'm sorry. Oh, no, you're fine. I got a big old tattoo of Memphis on my back, Do right? You? Some years ago because I said to myself, look, like somebody, and pe- I'm not the first, clearly, like people, you yourself, Fabian. Plenty of people have been putting on for the city for forever, but I feel like we've kind of entered the season where it's a different type of campaign, a mm-hmm. different type of stride we got. And so, um, yeah, I, I started believing on that in my whole heart, and I feel like that has created the space for me to really, you know, bloom where I was planted. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Wow. And you know what? I read that New York Times article from mm. um, the information that you sent me before we met today. And it was about you and your beautiful wife, Taliba, about uh, your wedding and how you all met. And I really want you to describe to the verbally effective audience, what does black love mean to you? Because y'all got some some deep. Man. I think the people need to know about it. Look, well, one thing for sure, we still learning because... If I, you know, we we got into it today. You hear me? So I don't think it's too okay. perfect. Hey, you know hey, how it, hey. it ebbs and it flows. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, that is my partner, mm-hmm. and we got over a decade in. We met at Overton. I might have mentioned. Mm-hmm. And for me, black love is right now. It requires like vulnerability because we got a whole lot of healing we need to do, mm-hmm. black men and black women independently and collectively. And in order to do it. We really kind of got to create spaces in our relationship to like uncover the ugly. You feel me? And so we, uh, that's something I'm still learning anyway. Like I can talk the vulnerability talk, but in practice, like it's tough. Like that's why we into it today. Cause I'd be struggling being vulnerable sometimes. Yeah. But I, um, I think that that 
is a, uh, an opportunity that exists for, for us and is necessary because we've seen so much trauma as a people. Mm -hmm. And so um, we've also seen the power of like a union, right? And so, you know, I'm excited that people find some joy or inspiration from me and Ms. Taliba. And, you know, we're gonna keep trying our best to figure it out. We ain't perfect by no stretch of the imagination. But uh, but yeah, we we gonna keep on keeping on, you know. What I'm saying? Yes, yes. Now let me ask you this: If there was no political red tape and mm -hmm. an unlimited budget, what would be something that you would implement to elevate the minds of the circumstances of the youth in Memphis? Oh my God! I laid it on you. Oh uh, yeah, <laughs> put my laptop in. <laughs> you got some time? Can I? Can I share my screen? <laughs> I got some. I, got I feel notes. like I feel like that would be easy for you to answer since you're in depth to the community. Well, you know? I'm still you know gaining my foot and learning my place there. But that that's a tall question because there's so much we need to do. Where do we begin? Right now, like I mentioned earlier, I think it's food, right? Because if we can't eat, we can't do nothing else, right? And the food that we eat impacts how we show up cognitively, relationally. And so that um, that budget, that blank check, I would spend it on um, a slate of urban farms run by black folks who are growing pure, organic, high nutrient food, like my girl Camille James at, at uh, okay, shout out Camille at, James at the pharmacy garden out yeah. in uh, at the Fraser Connect Center. You know, I be encouraging people to follow her her example and uh, grow right so that we can create a food production system that is self-sustainable that uh, makes it so that your children and my folks children that they know that beyond a shadow of a doubt they can at the very least eat some kale when they get ready to eat some kale you feel right. me and make them kale smoothies and so um you know what that system looks like it's funny we uh we are having conversations about it like all the time right because it's still a new conversation because capitalism has jacked things up right mm -hmm. and so we are really having to reimagine that and so yeah i'd invest in building that knowledge base i'd invest in young farmers so that they can have equipment and all the tools they need to grow i'd invest in fleets of electric vehicles so we're not mm -hmm. polluting the planet while we're moving our produce produce around I'd invest in um, engagements or uh, events that make it so that people can come and learn about why we need to care about this type of work. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, we I can like keep really on. really hanging uh, on a string right now, like with this environment. We hanging on a string. Man, my so I truth. ain't done all the research, but my partner Bobby at Black Seeds Urban Farms, he um, went out to a conference in L.A., it was a couple of weeks ago because y'all know they're running out of water. Like they are literally about this. rationing water in 2022. It's August 18th. And LA, I ain't been out there, but this is what I saw on the news and what my guy Bobby told me. He said that we're running out of water. I saw that. And so if you combine that with like, you know, forest fires out that way. How we run um, out of water? I don't know. Probably because people be like abusing the planet. Like, mm -hmm. like, like makers and producers be really rapacious with how they trying to make that stuff that ain't even good for people. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so if you do that for long enough, there are going to be consequences and like running out of water is like one of them. And so are we hanging by a thread? I don't know, but we running out of water for sure. So. Dang, I did see that. My friend shot me that article. I yeah. think it's in uh, California and Nevada. See, yeah, I, I, I honestly, I feel like I'm scared to do the research. Like I don't want to know. Like, right, yeah. right. Because these are they. You know, I was about to say these are scary times, but they're not because I do feel like we um, like we come from a resilient people, mm -hmm. and we've been able to make a way out of no way for a long time, mm -hmm. and we've been able to find solutions when people who were supposed to be in authority were kind of, you know, at their wit's end. And so I'm confident that there's some folks now who are listening and thinking about the solutions that will kind of help us see our way through this. So it ain't scary times, it's just scary hours. It's time for us to go to work. Go to work, time, yeah. go to work. And I know that you're very into the African diaspora. Mm -hmm. um, I saw you very active during, um, you know, we just had a, a huge, um, 
political season here in Memphis. Mm. I saw you went past the Earl out there. Man, you know, it's so it's, I'm embarrassed because. Why? Because I do feel like this season, this political season, this last campaign kind of activated some of me. But I've been disconnected, if I'm being honest. Like, I can't pretend to You got to start somewhere, though. Yeah, and I just you got did. started. That's why you can't be like, I'm with this and that, because, you know, but I- But you I've did been, something. Yeah, I definitely did something. Because a lot of people ain't doing nothing. That's facts. And, you know, it really was due to uh, Pastor Earl Fisher, my good brother at an Abyssinian yes. church. Uh, he, just, he shot me a- some on Instagram, and that, again, that just speaks to the power of community, uh, sharing information, which is something we really need to be leaning into right now. Well, he shot me a little video like, hey, yo, and it was like an all call. If you need help with your voting plan, holler at me. So yeah. I just immediately sent the email back. Uh, we had a previous relationship, but we ended up chopping it up, and so he had the idea to do the live Zoom situation. I and, saw it. And it yeah, inspired me to you know try to do a little bit, but... Um, yeah, I do think that that is a, a conversation that I'm excited to lean into more, especially in thinking about like policy related to food justice, et cetera, et cetera. Yes. And so, um, yeah, we want to support candidates that care about our holistic selves. And, you know, I, with this kind of new space I've been entering into, you know, with the TV show and, you know, Instagram follows going up and stuff like that. I yes. feel like How are you going to balance it all? It ain't a... Uh, um, oh, you working through it? Yeah, I I feel cool. I don't really feel no pressure as it relates no to that. Um, yeah, I, yeah. I haven't put enough thought into it though. Obviously, yeah. so ask me again, like in a week. But yeah, I'm I'm really looking to kind of just transmute that new energy into like you suggested, like issues that really matter. You feel me? Yes, yes. I mean, we all come to a point where, you know, it affects our lives, you know. Yeah, facts, facts. Yes, so, okay. Bertram Williams, Jr. Ina Esco, Jr. Tell me about Mama Sundry and what y'all got going on oh, over there, man. Mama Sundry. Thank you so much. Right. Yes, <laughs> um, yes. So, in 2020, um, my wife, Taliba, her mother, Mama Queen Dosunmu Sadio. Uh, yes. <laughs> she... Uh, and a few other makers, we came together to uh, just kind of envision a social enterprise that would help connect consumers to products that were not harmful. You know what I'm saying? It's crazy to think about the fact that a lot of the stuff that we buy and is sold, got a barcode on it, is on the shelf, is actually harmful, right? Mm -hmm. And so as we started to learn about, it's crazy. Mm -hmm. but we started to learn about that and we are look, are actively looking to like fight against that by simply, um, making new things and making new, uh, helping people to become aware of that. And so, um, you know, I remember somebody saying before, like, uh, don't get mad, get creative. Right. Mm -hmm. And so we got creative, um, and came up with Mama Sundry, which is uh, basically now a learning cooperative that is focused on holistic wellness. Right. Mm -hmm. So we're thinking about sustainable agriculture. We're thinking about the household and we're thinking about how we relate to the planet, how we interface with the planet. And so we host events. We uh, we did a joint last November called Pot Liquor. It was lit. We're gonna do it again this November. So what y'all do this. over there at Pot Liquor? Man, so man, my folks, my folks be cooking, man. So my gal made some chicken. Uh, I'm blank. It's some a good at, good tail soup. Uh, Camille, uh, who I was just talking about at Pharmacy's Garden, made some delicious pot liquor from greens that were grown locally. Maybe not. I don't know. Um, and a few other chefs came through, and so we just shared a meal uh, out at Everbloom Farms, mm -hmm. which is in or near Millington, where you okay. went to high school. Our good people, uh, Kenneth and Tien Anderson, uh, powerful. I'm talking about black excellence personified. They uh, own and run a homestead out there where folks host events, 20 acres, wow. absolutely beautiful. And so uh, acres. I, I'm rambling because I'm clearly excited, but we host events at spaces like that with people like that. And uh, we um, are in the process, like we make products, we're trying to fill in the gaps, right, uh, and create alternatives. And so the last product drop we had is something that uh, our good friend and uh, co-conspirator, Nikki uh, Boyd, put together. It's called the Bring Your Own. Oh yeah, a bag. Okay, uh, okay. And that bag is uh, <laughs> is supposed to be an alternative to us using plastic bags in the grocery store and stuff. Right. You know what I mean? And so right. we're looking to create so solutions like that, and mm -hmm. just thinking in community about how we heal ourselves and the planet. 
That was a long answer, but that's no, what you do with good. my No, you're good. You're good. I know tomorrow you all have an event um, in which this podcast will air on Monday, but I, I do know tomorrow you all are going to do the Frasier Connect, right? Yeah, yeah. So we're doing the Kitchen takeover talk. out there. Yeah, and we can talk about this because we mm-hmm. are, like this, looking to have more inspired conversations around yes. holistic wellness. And so the Mama Sundry, Mama Sundry team will be uh, producing and releasing a podcast that – you know, create space for folks to talk about it. So mm-hmm. at some point, I know you're busy running this verbally effective thing, but hopefully you'll pop over <laughs> and we'll be able to, to talk about your relationship with plants and yes. wellness and family. Uh, and so, yeah, we'll be launching that thing tomorrow. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, Taliba's going to perform after that because we love to kind of show up at the intersection of like art and education, right? That's been kind of my sweet spot for a little while. And you know, we are cultural people, and so, uh, yeah, we're going to kick it tomorrow over some good food, some music, and hopefully leave having learned something that's going to, you know, make us walk a little differently, think a little differently, shop a little differently, yes. ultimately, and do a community a little differently. Okay, yes, I will be there tomorrow to check you guys out and yeah. learn and learn more. We're learning together, and that's the thing. Yes. We're we not coming to it like we know nothing. Like, we we walking and learning in community. Mm-hmm. Okay, so tell me what's coming up on the acting landscape. Are you busy with Hattie Lou, and are you moving to L.A. soon? What is going on? Right, so <laughs> um, look, at Hattie Lou, uh, you know, I'm a supporter. Look, Ed called me tomorrow and yes. said, hey, man, I need you to come run the bar. I'm going to go run the bar, you know. help move some chairs. Um, and I don't think I'm a, you know, people ask about me moving all the time. And, you know, I'm fortunate in that. I'm able to kind of do relationship like I talked about LZ earlier virtually mm-hmm. nowadays. And so yeah. I'm able to audition that same way right oh, now. Oh, they audition virtually yeah, now. Yeah, so we just send tapes, right? Um, you know, you get your script and it's on you to record it. I hit my boy Ralph or Taliba up to uh, help me record my audition and we send it off. So I'm able to stay engaged in that regard from the town which is fortunate because we got a lot of work to do right now. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so... Um, to be real, like I'm kind of prioritizing what we got to do here over trying to go out and chase the dream, quote unquote, you know. Gotcha. I, um, yeah, I, I'm looking at this season as one where it's like I'm super fortunate and like I would feel real whack if I didn't, you know, use this time to like continue to pour into the town that made me. So mm-hmm. I guess there's a long way of answering that. You know, I probably but is ain't moving it like nowhere. your dream, like to. To be very successful in the acting world? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, and so if, you know, if it ever becomes blatantly clear that I got to move to do that, mm-hmm. of course I'm going to do that. And I'm clearly cool with moving for the work. Like, when when it's booking time, like, I'm shipping out. But okay. as far as where my roots are set, like, I, I don't see really, you know, uh, you know, uprooting myself from the town. Like, this is, this is where I was made. This is where I done... Got paid just a little bit, and this is where I'm going to stay. In Big Memphis. Big Memphis. Memphis, yes. Memphis, Memphis, Memphis. The most yes. beautifulest land in the world. It is indeed, yeah. indeed. Well, Bertram Williams Jr., I have truly enjoyed you today on the Verbally sure. Effective Podcast. You are indeed verbally effective. You know that, right? Am I? You are. All right, I'll take it. You are. You are. Could you let the good people know how they can continue to follow your journey for sure i um so my myspace is uh my myspace it's uh supernova 38115 on there my black uh now instagram is bertram bill <laughs> same on twitter i ain't really active on there yet but now that i'm crowned verbally effective maybe i'm that's gonna be that's gonna be my first tweet you guess so. i am verbally effective yeah. Uh, also, you knew the Twitter. yeah i got a profile it's bertram bills but i don't be on the job uh, like when that. you start you're not yeah. gonna stop Really? I, I don't think you'll stop once you get into that space on Twitter. What What's different about because it? Because I, I think that, like, you know, you do a lot with your mind. And mm. That's the difference. Mm. It, to me, Twitter is a is a platform more for intellectuals, I get in my part. opinion. I can see that for sure. Yeah. For sure. So, yeah. It's eventually, not about visuals. Yeah. I hear that. Mm-hmm. Um, Facebook, I'm BJ Williams. That's what I grew up as. And so, yeah, I... I look forward to, you know, staying connected with you and anybody else under yes. the sound of my voice. Um, yes. uh, it was something else. Oh, Mama Sundry. Like, I want to, I really want to tap in with people through the Mama Sundry vehicle. So we got uh, Mama Sundry Instagram and Facebook. I'll be starting, like, a little Facebook group, a place for us to do some of that virtual learning together. 
Okay. Eventually, maybe a Patreon, and so. Uh, oh, definitely. Yeah, if that's yeah. If you're trying to tap in, that's what we're tapping in because I'm trying to work. We need to save the planet, man. We need to figure, save figure this it. out. So, know? so my kids can grow up. Come Lord, on, now. please. Come on, I'm scared to have them. Okay, you Crazy. scared to have them? No, not is for that me. what it is? Not for, I'll be working on it. Are you be working on it? Oh wow! Oh wow! Well, Bertram Williams Jr., I have enjoyed you today Thank on the Verbally Effective Podcast. Anybody want to shout out before we close out? Uh, shout out to you. Thank uh, you. Shout out to my mom and my daddy, Bertram Senior, Lorna Williams. Uh, shout out to God. <laughs> It's a mess, a mess. Make sure you are following Bertram Williams Jr.'s journey on social media. Stay tapped into what he's doing with P Valley, with Mama Sundry, with saving the planet in general. Hey, he might be a politician in Memphis. We never know. We never know. But thank you guys for tuning in yet again to the Verbally Effective Podcast, powered by We Are Memphis. Subscribe to their YouTube channel as well, Ina Esco. And I'll see you guys next week. Thanks.